Um, so next speaker is uh, Richard Remsing uh, from Rutgers University. And uh, hi, Richard. Hi, how are you? Uh, fine, thank you very much. <laughs> and I will speak about modeling dry of uh, non confined liquids. Uh, please. Great. Uh, so I'll try to share my screen. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, arriving. Awesome. Good. Fantastic. Uh, so thank you uh, for the introduction and, and thank you uh, for the organizers for, for inviting me to this. This workshop has been great so far and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the talks. Uh, so I was asked to talk about some, some work that I've been involved with over the years uh, using molecular simulations to model drying of, of liquids confined, uh, in this case, between hydrophobic uh, walls, uh, is what we're going to talk about for the most part, so nonpolar walls. Uh, and so we'll basically get started here. I will say that uh, most of this is uh, has been part of different collaborations with different people, and I'll mention them as we go on and uh, through the end. And this here in the, in the first slide is just our, our new chemistry building at Rutgers, so we're are very happy to have this, so we'd like to, to show it a little bit. All right, so I think this is kind of old news for, for everyone here at this workshop, uh, but confined liquids are really different than, than bulk liquids, right? I think everyone knows that, and, and uh, you know, the introduction to the workshop that we had yesterday really made this very clear. Uh, and so, in particular, when you confine liquids to nonpolar surfaces, uh, in between nonpolar surfaces, they can undergo capillary evaporation or drying. I, I will say that kind of throughout the talk, I'll often say drying just because it's shorter than saying capillary evaporation over and over. Uh, but these are two, two different phenomena. Uh, so there's some real nice work, uh, classic work from Bob Evans, for example, if people want to look into that a little more. Uh, but I just want to make that distinction clear up front. And so there's sort of classic examples. Of course, we were going to hear throughout this workshop about things like hydrophobic gating in, in ion channels, but there's uh, this classic example of a, a drying or de-wetting transition uh, between melaton dimers assembling into a melaton tetramer that was studied by Bruce Byrne in the early 2000s. Uh, we're not gonna talk about things this complex in, in this talk. We'll just talk about a very idealized system where we have water or some other liquids uh, confined between planar uh, square nonpolar surfaces, right? So these are just simple uh, Leonard Jones particles organized to make a, a plate. Okay. And I wanna talk a little bit about the perspective that we take when, when thinking about drying in these systems. And really it starts with understanding solvation uh, of hydrophobic particles and so I'll talk about that briefly before coming back to what happens when you have two large hydrophobic particles, which is the case here. Um, so if we think about hydrophobic assembly, which is ultimately uh, driving the work for us, where we're thinking about uh, two large solutes assembling in some way, like like uh, you know, the, the melaton tetramer I showed from, from Burns' work. And so we can, you know, the thing that we want is this potential of mean force between two particles. So the free energy as a function of the distance between them. And you can determine this exactly in terms of solvation free energy. So this would be the difference between solvating the two particles at one distance, maybe far apart, and the solvation free energy of solvating those two particles closer together. And this would give you this potential of mean force that you're interested in. And it's going to account for effects of the solvent, right? And so when these two solutes are, are hydrophobic or, or nonpolar and, or generally solvophobic, uh, drying can play an important role in this process. And so we need to understand what's, what's going on, uh, at least from the solvation perspective, in order to understand drying in these systems. And interestingly, you know, maybe a few people in this audience uh, are very familiar with this, hydration of hydrophobic solutes depend on their size. So if I have a, a large hydrophobic solute, uh, water can't maintain its hydrogen bond network around it anymore. Hydrogen bonds have to break at the surface. On average, uh, one hydrogen bond per molecule breaks, the water can reorient a little bit uh, to, to only lose one. And when you do this around a large solute, you're nucleating a soft liquid vapor-like interface and forming this interface 
uh, incurs an anthropic penalty. And if you think about salvation free energies of these large particles, uh, the salvation free energy there behaves like a, a surface free energy. So a surface tension times an area term. Okay. In contrast, if we have small solutes, these small solutes uh, can essentially fit within the hydrogen bond network of water. The hydrogen bonds can go around it, they don't break. Uh, but because you are constraining the configuration space accessible to the water molecules, you do incur some ent entropic penalty. And the salvation free energy behaves different in this limit. Uh, so it scales with the, the solute volume instead of the, the surface area like we saw for the large solutes. And so the, this implies that there's a crossover somewhere uh, between small solute behavior and large solute behavior. And in water, this crossover happens essentially exactly where the hydrogen bond network uh, can't be maintained geometrically around the solute. So once you uh, geometrically have to break the hydrogen bond network, that's when drying occurs. I will say that that's not a uh, a universal thing for liquids. So in a, you know, a simple Leonard Jones liquid, for example, this crossover happens uh, at a different length scale uh, because it doesn't have hydrogen bonds. So there it happens uh, roughly when the solute size is the same as a Leonard Jones particle. And so we, uh, if you're interested in those kind of comparisons between Leonard Jones and, and water, uh, John Weeks and I wrote this paper on it in 2013. Uh, but all of this is just to say that assembly has a size dependence and big solutes are, are different than, than small ones. Okay. And so we can start thinking about how and, and why these are different. And in terms of what we're going to talk about today, this, this difference really lies in the density fluctuations within the liquid. And so if I, I think about a, an ideal hydrophobic solute, this is just going to be an excluded volume or, or a hard sphere. And so the salvation free energy of a hard sphere, here I'm calling it beta delta mu, so I'm putting it in units of Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, it's related to the probability of finding a cavity empty in the liquid of the same size and shape as the solute. So this zero here, corresponds to finding zero solvent molecules in the volume uh, of the, the solute or the, or the cavity. And so you can kind of see the difference in these two schematic pictures I've drawn at the bottom, where if I'm trying to insert uh, small hard sphere solutes or equivalently look for the formation of small cavities, uh, you're gonna see that this kind of readily occurs, right? So there are, these transient small cavities that form just from the typical density fluctuations that are happening uh, in a liquid. Uh, but these larger solutes, finding a spontaneous fluctuation that creates a large cavity is going to be rare, right? So these, these large density fluctuations are going to be different than on the small scales, right? And we can see this manifest in the solvation free energy where the scaling is different at small and large scales. And so one of the key insights into understanding the, the difference in these small scale fluctuations uh, was given by, by one of our earlier speakers today, Gerhard Hummer and, and co-workers in 1996, uh, where they showed that for these small volumes, density fluctuations are Gaussian. So if we look at the, the distribution uh, of finding a certain number of solvent molecules inside this cavity volume, right? So we're not actually inserting a cavity, we're just looking uh, inside some specified volume and asking how many molecules are in there. We find that to a very good approximation, the simulation results shown as data points are described well by a Gaussian curve, which is this uh, solid line, right? And our salvation free energy here is going to be related to this minus log P of zero all the way at the end. And what this is essentially saying is that the, these Gaussian fluctuations right, are, are consistent with the typical density fluctuations that you see on these length scales in the liquid. Right? So you could describe them, for example, uh, with knowledge of the G of R. So your pairwise correlations in the liquid, you can describe these, these Gaussian fluctuations. 
And in water, these fluctuations don't disrupt the hydrogen bonding. For large volumes, you see something very different. Uh, so again, we're looking at the same thing, the, the logarithm of the probability distribution. Here, we're, we're making it negative because now it's a, to write it as a free energy. And if these density fluctuations in a large volume were Gaussian, they would follow this solid line. But instead, you get this large, fat, non-Gaussian tail at low end for large volumes in something like water uh, and other uh, typical liquids. And whenever you see these fat tails in these free energies, uh, this really signals some type of underlying phase instability. And in water at, at room temperature and, and pressure, you're, you're close to coexistence. And so this is signaling a, an underlying uh, liquid vapor-like transition somewhere. And really when we're creating this large cavity, this signals that we're forming uh, or nucleating a liquid vapor-like interface uh, in order to form this cavity, right? So forming that interface makes it easier to create the large cavity than if you followed these Gaussian statistics all the way up, right? And so these Gaussian statistics would be uh, consistent with liquids that aren't forming this type of interface. For example, if you looked at large cavity formation in a hard sphere liquid. So what does this have to do with confinement, right? Uh, and so essentially, when uh, we're thinking about confinement, we're going to take kind of a density fluctuation centric approach to, to understanding uh, water and liquids in confinement. And so first, if we look at uh, not two walls, but a single wall. So here is a schematic of what's going on. We have this uh, purple box it is a uh, ideal hard wall immersed in liquid water. And we want to look at density fluctuations within the region of this, this green box. And we can have attractions or we can not have attractions. So the, the, the top left panel has the, this shaded region that is indicating uh, attractive interactions between the wall and the, and the water. The bottom panel indicates we're turning them off. But either way, we're looking in this same volume. And if we look at density fluctuations near these ideal hydrophobic walls, uh, they're significantly non-Gaussian, and so the red curve corresponds to attractions, the blue to, to no attractions. And so as we turn off the attractions and make the wall more hydrophobic, uh, the fat tails in the distribution get fatter, right? So this is, you know, we kind of have two key things going on here. So first, near the surface, the density fluctuations are, are non-Gaussian. And then as we make a surface more hydrophobic, uh, the fat tails get even fatter. Right, so the more hydrophobic a surface is, the more the density fluctuations next to that surface are enhanced. So that's for, for one surface. So, so now what happens if we have two surfaces? Right. Uh, so we can now confine our liquid between two uh, nonpolar plates, and we can start asking how does drying or dewetting transitions occur in these confined spaces? And the classic picture is that we have these two plates and there's some spontaneous fluctuation that happens that forms a vapor tube. So uh, on the left three panels, we're looking kind of straight on. And if we turn them on an angle, we can see this cylindrical vapor tube forming. The cylindrical vapor tube has some radius R. And uh, at some point that vapor tube will grow and the region between the plates will become completely dry. And if we look at the uh, thermodynamic predictions for the free energy of this process, I'm showing it here for three different spacings of the, of the plates. On the left, we have the radius of the vapor tube equal to zero. So as our, our vapor tube grows, the free energy is uphill, right? So it's, it costs some free energy, or we have to do some work to initially create the vapor tube. But then we can get to a, a critical vapor tube radius uh, where, we, where we reach this barrier in the free energy. And then after that critical radius, it's all downhill and the vapor tube can spontaneously grow and the region between the plates can dry. Right. So this is sort of the, the classic picture of drying between two plates. But I just spent uh, 
you know, uh, about 10 minutes talking about density fluctuations. So here we're, we're not really talking too much about density fluctuations except for forming that initial tube. So where do density fluctuations come in, right? And so we can probe these in, in simulations uh, using a technique called indirect umbrella sampling. I've already showed you some of the results from this uh, approach, uh, which we for short call INDIS. And the idea is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we would like to bias N, but N, the number of molecules, is a discrete variable. And so if we try to get forces, that's not too great, right? So uh, we want to bias instead some continuous variable where we can get uh, well-behaved forces, right? So we can differentiate the biasing potentials. And so we instead replace N with its uh, some smooth variant of it, uh, which we call N tilde, that is highly correlated to N. So then we can do all our typical enhanced sampling or biasing approaches like umbrella sampling, uh, replica exchange, whatever you wanna do. We typically use umbrella sampling, uh, but you can do it in with this N tilde as your order parameter. And then if you get the joint distribution of the two, you can integrate that and get back out the, the distribution that you want, right? The one in terms of your discrete variable. And sort of just a schematic of what we're doing, right? We, we identify some volume. We want to bias the number of molecules in that volume. Uh, we do this using this Indus approach and the free energy we get back out looks like this here. Uh, and this is for a small volume and we can extend this, for example, to dynamical volumes, which we've done, and to you know, leverage some of the physics of, of these uh, problems to create more efficient sampling schemes as well. But I won't talk about them anymore here. So we're gonna use this to look at density fluctuations between two hydrophobic plates. So we have our, our plates in water, and we define our probe volume that we're going to perform this indus sampling. Uh, the probe volume here is just the region confined between the two plates. So it's, say it's defined by where the plates are. And the two configurations that I'm showing here, the left one corresponds to a typical uh, configuration where the space is, is wet between the plates. So N is approximately the number of molecules in the liquid state. Uh, and on the right, we have it in the vapor basin or the vapor phase where the region is de-wet. So we can compute this free energy uh, with Indus and, and umbrella sampling. And when we do this, we get free energy curves that look like the ones that I'm showing here. Uh, so here I'm showing you free energies as a function of N, right? So in terms of our probability distributions, this is minus log P of N. And I'm showing it for a few different uh, plate separations indicated by this value D. And so we see some similar features for, for all of these. Uh, so at high N, we have a, a liquid basin. So that's this, the minimum in the free energy. At high N corresponds to the liquid phase. At low N, you have another minimum uh, that corresponds to the vapor phase between the plates. And, and either of these minima, depending on the plate separation, can be stable or metastable. And if you make the plates far enough apart, the vapor will become uh, unstable and the same for the liquid as you make the plates come very close again. All of these curves have some kind of barrier. Uh, and in some cases, these barriers are correspond to a sharp kind of kink. And at larger plate separations, you have this kink, but then you still have a free energy barrier after that. So the first thing we can do is, is ask, how does this compare to the, the macroscopic picture that I showed a, a couple slides ago, right? Where we had this vapor tube forming and we had uh, these kind of smooth free energy curves uh, as a function of the tube radius. So we can write down what this free energy would be as predicted by macroscopic thermodynamics. And there are three terms, one of which is a, a liquid vapor interfacial term, another, corresponds to the, the liquid solid interface. And then lastly, we found that you need a term that also describes the three phase contact line that involves the, the line tension lambda. And we can fit our simulation results uh, to this 
uh, expression for the free energy, right? And we can determine things like the contact angle from other simulations. And if we convert our free energy from N to R, which is the vapor tube radius through an approximate relation between the two, we see that this expression fits really well to the low N or the large R part of the free energy profiles, right? And so what this means is that once we have this, uh, what, what it looks like happening is that, you know, it, when N is small or when the tube radius is large, uh, we really do have something that looks like the macroscopic predictions of we have a vapor tube spanning between the two plates and, and growing to dry the entire interplate region. Right, but what about the rest of the free energies? Uh, I'm only showing you the, the data points for some, what about the rest of the curves? And so if we look at the rest of the free energy curve, uh, we see that once we hit this barrier, the theory shown as the dashed line disagrees with what we're getting from the simulations, right? And in fact, uh, we're sort of getting a, a, an undercutting of the macroscopic thermodynamics by the, the results that we're actually seeing in the simulations. And, and the barrier in this case is, is lower than the barrier predicted by macroscopic uh, thermodynamics. So what is going on, right? And so here I'm just converting back from, N to, from R to N. Uh, so this is still the same plot I showed you on the last slide, just the x-axis is inverted. Uh, and so the dashed line is still our macroscopic thermodynamic predictions. So at, if we start from the liquid basin and start to dry the interplate region, the first thing that happens is that because of these enhanced density fluctuations near the walls, we get bubble nucleation preferentially occurring on the hydrophobic plate surfaces. And so here I'm showing a, a snapshot of uh, the Willard Chandler instantaneous interface that defines the vapor bubble. Uh, and, and here I'm showing a snapshot where it's occurring on one wall. It can, of course, uh, occur on, on both. Uh, but this is just to, uh, to indicate that we have first bubbles forming on these walls because of these enhanced density fluctuations. We don't go right to a a plate spanning vapor tube, we instead get these bubbles first. Then at low end, uh, we do have a vapor tube, right? And so here we're showing a similar interface uh, for the vapor tube spanning the walls, and that can grow uh, until the entire region between the plates is dry. And then at this kink here, we essentially have a jump uh, moving from bubbles forming to a vapor tube. So we have some kind of transition between the two. And in this case, the transition occurs in a way that the vapor tube is already super critical. So we don't need, uh, so the vapor tube that forms is not the vapor tube that would correspond to the barrier in the classic uh, macroscopic thermodynamic predictions. Of course, that's not to say that that can't happen. So if we have larger interplate separations, like the plot shown on the right here, we still have a kink, uh, but the vapor tube that forms after that kink uh, is subcritical and it still needs to grow before it reaches the barrier, uh, the free energy barrier, which in this case is consistent with the macroscopic thermodynamic predictions. And you can even determine this for, for every value of the plate separations that we've looked at, and that's shown in this figure in the bottom right, uh, where N kink is the value of N at the kink, where you transition from bubbles to tubes, uh, and N max is the N for where you have this free energy barrier. And so you can see that there's some critical distance above which these two uh, don't agree anymore. Uh, all this is to say that there's some transition between at high N, you, you start forming these, these bubbles, but then at low end you have tubes and there's some transition between the two. You don't just start off with a vapor tube that, that grows. And this was uh, later uh, also shown with different methods uh, by this really nice paper from, from Pablo de Benedetti and, and his group, uh, where they used forward flux sampling to determine evaporation rates of water uh, between flexible hydrophobic surfaces uh, where they showed that more flexible surfaces uh, evaporate water faster, uh, which is 
you know, qualitatively, they can bend inward, right? Of, uh, essentially making the, the confined space uh, smaller. But through these forward flux sampling calculations, they also showed that the, the way that this transition happens is that you go from uh, liquid between plates to bubbles to tubes and then tubes grow. So the, the same qualitative thing uh, that, that we're seeing. So then I was lucky enough to be involved in an ongoing collaboration studying other liquids, and in particular ionic liquids uh, with Hamant Kashyap at IIT Delhi. Uh, the collaboration originally started with a student of his, Gaurav, uh, and is now continued by, by Harinder. Uh, and so here we're thinking about not water, but what happens if we put ionic liquids made up of these bulky organic ions uh, between these confined plates, right? So is drying here different uh, than drying in water, right? And so we can do all the same stuff, compute free energies, uh, and we see some similar qualitative features. We see fat tails, we see bubbles, we see kinks, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are some interesting differences. So, for example, you know, uh, I showed that for the that the barrier heights in water uh, follow macroscopic predictions pretty well, uh, but for these ionic liquids, they don't. They kind of sit around the macroscopic prediction, but they have some deviations. And so, if we look at the structure in these ionic liquids as a function of the distance between the plates, what we see is that there are significant structural changes at the interface, depending on how strongly confined uh, the liquid is. So we can have bilayers, trilayers, multilayers, and, and so on. And these changes in interfacial structure really lead to these changes in, in the free energy barriers uh, for, for this de-wetting transition. And Around the same time that we were doing this, uh, Pablo de Benedetti also uh, was looking further at water with their, <coughs> excuse me, uh, using their, their forward flux sampling approach to look at, uh, again, kinetics of drying. And they showed that if you can find water enough, you can have similar structural chain transitions where water goes from a bilayer between the, the plates to a trilayer, and when this occurs, you have a change in the scaling of the barrier to evaporation between the plates. And so this similar behavior that is found for water at these small spacings is seen also for these large bulky ionic liquids, but we actually see more deviations because there are more structural transitions, right? So we have these bulky ions that can lay flat or perpendicular or everywhere in between, and they also can have these different layerings uh, involving interplays between the cations and the anions. So more recently, what we've uh, been involved with is now taking these organic ions and also mixing them with water. And, and this again is with Hemant and, and his group, and it's really led by Hemant and his group. And so here we're looking at lithium TFSI. So we have a, a small cation and a bulky anion now. And we're going to have water in there. And so this is at 20 molal concentration. And we'll look at uh, other concentrations as well. So we're going to have the same basic setup. Uh, and we can ask, is drying different from water? And is there any interesting concentration dependence here? So the free energy profiles are, are pretty similar to what we saw for water and ionic liquids qualitatively, right? There's a liquid basins, vapor basins, fat tails, barriers, etc. And just like ionic liquids, we see that free energy barriers can deviate from the macroscopic theory whenever there's changes in interfacial structure. So here we're showing a, you know, a select range of, of D values, so plate separations, uh, and how it compares to this macroscopic theory. But we can start looking a little more in depth, like we did before. And so first we can do the same things we did for water. And we can look at things like how does the free energy curves compare to macroscopic theory. And we see the same qualitative behavior where we have uh, a vapor tube growing at low end. So this black dashed line, 
uh, intersecting with these fat tails at higher end to make a kink. And we see you know, bubbles forming next to plates before tubes form, and then the tubes grow as you proceed uh, to dry between the plates, right? So qualitatively, the process is pretty similar to water and for ionic liquids, at least for these values of interplate separations. But once we make the plates larger, uh, there's something pretty interesting going on, and it appears that there are uh, two kinks now. Uh, so we have the one kink occurring at, at what is labeled here as N sub, right? N subcritical is what that is short for, where we're transitioning from bubbles to a subcritical vapor tube. But then there's another kink once you transition to a supercritical vapor tube, so where you have the free energy barrier. And this can be fit pretty well with, with two uh, macroscopic thermodynamic free energy landscapes, so a piecewise free energy landscape, if you will. Um, and this is in line with structural changes that occur as the system dries. So there are significant changes that are occurring both at the interface and at the three-phase contact line as you decrease N along this free energy. Um, and those types of changes aren't occurring in, in something like liquid water because you don't have this interplay between the bulky ions, water, etc. So something that, that may be even more interesting is the concentration dependence. And so we can add more water, lower the concentration of the lithium TFSI. And when we do that, right, we're adding more water to the system. So we're increasing the number of molecules between the plates. We're increasing uh, the density essentially in, in, the, in the interplate region. But despite having to empty more molecules from the region between the plates, the barriers to evaporation are lower. Right? So we, when we decrease the concentration, we're moving from the green curve to the purple to the orange. So the barrier is decreasing dramatically. So what is going on here? Right? If we think about what we typically think about in macroscopic theory, we would focus on the contact angle and the surface tension. And so we can calculate these from other means. Right? So the surface tension we can get by looking at components of the pressure tensor in a, in a liquid vapor slab simulation. The contact angle, we can just put a droplet of the liquid on the plates and determine the contact angle from simulations. And, and this was done here. And what you see is that as you increase concentration, both the contact angle and the surface tension go down. And what that would say is that our barrier should increase. Right. So for macroscopic theory, if the contact angle and the surface tension dominate the behavior, our barrier should go up. We're seeing the exact opposite, right, and, and dramatically. So we can focus on the other thermodynamic quantity in this expression, which is the line tension. And it turns out that the line tension is increasing uh, significantly as you increase the concentration, and it's well described by, by this uh, equation here. And so what, what we see happening is that the, the line tension is increasing in a way that it more than compensates the decreases in the contact angle and the surface tension. And the line tension uh, is really what's decreasing the barrier to drying here. And so here we're showing uh, in, this, in this plot, the dashed lines are the macroscopic theory predictions for the three different concentrations that we did the simulations for. Uh, and so you can see how that changes uh, with concentration. In particular, if you pick one fixed interplate distance, you can see dram how, how dramatically uh, the barriers decrease going from 20 to 10 to 5 molar. Right, so I thought this was you know, pretty interesting that, that the line tension is really what's driving this behavior, and, it, and especially since line tension is often something we're not thinking about when we're you know, maybe trying to design a material for, for drying transitions, for example. Uh, instead, we usually focus on contact angles and surface tensions. All right. So with the last few minutes I have, I want to talk about something else. So I want to give you a quick kind of recap here uh, of what I've been emphasizing. So for liquids between plates, generally we have this bubbles forming first and vapor tubes when you're near hydrophobic plates or, or solvophobic plates more generally. 
Uh, ionic liquids, water and salt and electrolytes are similar to water, but with more structural changes. And I just emphasize this line tension thing. Uh, but I want to get back to assembly and, and talk about modeling assembly and, and computing potentials of mean force, especially when solvent mediated interactions are important. And so for people who are doing simulations, especially with large systems, uh, it's well known that you, know, you need to simulate many, many, many molecules of the solvent uh, in order to, to do these simulations. And that can be pretty expensive, right? And so uh, one thing I want to talk about is a, a recent approach that, that I, we've been working on uh, to simplify at least part of this problem. And in particular, uh, increasing efficiency of these calculations by removing long range interactions. And so if we have something like a uniform fluid, the effect of long, interact long range interactions has been understood uh, qualitatively since Ben Whittem in the, in the 60s and, and quantitatively with WCA theory in the 70s, uh, where if we look at any particle in a uniform liquid, uh, you can have its neighbors acting on it from, from the right, let's say, and from the left. And to a good approximation, the long range interactions cancel uh, configuration by configuration. And so removing long range interactions in uniform liquids, right, either uh, Leonard-Jones attractions in a Leonard-Jones liquid or long range coulombic tails in something like water is a very good approximation. And generally, uh, when you truncate things like long range electrostatic interactions and do a simulation of the uniform system of water, you'll get the same structural features, for example, like the various G of R's uh, as you would in, in the fully interacting system. But if we added a solute, the picture changes. Uh, so we no longer have this nice cancellation. Instead, when you have a solute or a wall, any particles near that wall are not going to have this nice force cancellation. Instead, you know, if I have a particle at the wall and its neighbors are pulling it to the right, I might not have anything pulling it to the left. And so that creates what is known as unbalanced forces, and these can be responsible for things like drying. So this uh, ultimately is what's causing uh, things like nucleation of a soft liquid vapor-like interface, enhanced density fluctuations, and, and so on. But if we wanted to get rid of the long range interactions in this scenario, for example, to, to speed up a calculation, we could account for them in an averaged way right, using uh, something that's been recently developed called local molecular field or LMF theory. And just to give you a quick example of where this uh, works well, or, or a nice, uh, where, where the short range system fails really bad and the LMF does a lot. If we have drying of a wall, in this case for a Leonard Jones system, and we remove attractions to simulate a WCA or a purely repulsive liquid, we would wet the wall and get the red curve. But if we account for these averaged unbalancing forces with this local molecular field theory, we get this blue curve, which so we get the right structure. And then we can even use it to predict the right thermodynamics. So we go from uh, the red curve is the, the, the short range system without accounting for unbalanced forces and the blue dots or the blue stars uh, are this LMF system where we account for the unbalanced forces, but we still have a short range solvent and it gives quantitatively accurate results in agreement with the full system. So we've recently extended this to potentials of mean force uh, using something that we call the short solvent model. And in particular, we're interested in getting rid of long ranged electrostatic interactions. So we don't have to do things like Ewald sums and, and deal with the various artifacts and finite size effects that come with them. And so essentially what we do is we remove all the solvent solvent and solute solvent long range interactions. And so if you're doing efficient Ewald sums and you have something that scales like n log n, you still have that scaling, but now it only scales with the number of solute molecules. So this is ns log ns, where ns is the number of solutes. And typically your number of solutes are much, much less than your number of solvent molecules. So you still have the, the, the scaling if you need to do Ewald between solutes, uh, but you're removing all of those costly lattice summations for 
your solvent solvent interactions. And so the idea is that we we map a, a full fully interacting system where we have solvents shown in blue, labeled W for water, and we have two solutes onto something that we call the short solvent system, which has short ranged solvent molecules, but now our solute solute direct interactions are modified and they're modified in a way that accounts for the average effects of these long range interactions. And so for example, we can get things like non-trivial ionic correlations, correct? So in the right panel here, for example, is calcium chloride pairing, where if you neglect long range electrostatics, you go from the, the black fully interacting radial distribution function, which is the, the exponential of the PMF. Uh, instead, you get to this green curve, which, ver which very severely underestimates the peaks in the radial distribution function. But this short solvent model gets those correct. I'm just about out of time. I just want to also say that this also works for drying. So if we look at two C60s that are repulsive, where we have drying, we can use this short solvent model to get quantitatively accurate predictions, even in kind of maybe uh, pathological scenarios where you would truncate letter Jones attractions and get rid of the drying altogether. And with that, I'll just uh, put up some some. A quick recap that we have, you know, this picture of drying moving from bubbles to tubes. Uh, for the short solvent model, we're, we're currently writing up some results extending them to molecular systems. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye out. I want to acknowledge everyone that, that I've been in, uh, involved in this work with. So the water work was done when I was a postdoc with Amish Patel, uh, Hamant Kashyap, and his group at IIT Delhi for, for uh, this. Uh, very exciting collaboration on ionic liquids and water and salt electrolytes. And the short solvent model stuff was, was really led by, by Ang Gao, who's a new assistant professor at, at Beijing University of Posts and, and Telecommunications. Uh, and that work is spearheaded by John Weeks at University of Maryland. And with that, I will take if, any questions if there are any, and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Rick, for your nice talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Perhaps I will pick one for each of the uh, person who has asked. Mm -hmm. uh, so first one is from uh, Bart Pagosh, who asks, in the drying between the two large plates, as the drying happens, the molecules are removed from, inter from intermediate plane, I guess. Uh, how do you take care of the entropy or entropy change? So if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, I mean, so I guess there's two scenarios where you might want to take into account for the entropy. So first, in the simulations, it's there because we're simulating everything in atomistic detail. In the theory, one thing that I left out on the slides when I wrote down the theory is that you, you need to account for the entropy of the vapor tube, but that's done pretty simply. I mean, you just have to account for the amount of space that the vapor tube uh, can move within between the plates. Okay, uh, let me move to the second question that is from Antonio Tinti. He asks, thank you for your nice talk. Have you considered the possibility that more complex paths uh, can give a possible interpretation of the fail of, of the fat tails? Does the shape of the cavity have a role in determining solvation-free energy? In other terms, is there any relevant descriptor other than the volume? Yeah, so this is a, a great question. Uh, so. You've probably noticed that I didn't too, talk too much about the the pathway going between these two, right? So, uh, yeah. So at at that barrier, of course, there is uh, this n is no longer a. I wouldn't say n is a good reaction coordinate at this barrier. So we're using it as an order parameter, but it's not describing the pathway well, right? So as you get close to the barrier you're going to have configurations with the same N that have vapor tubes and bubbles. So of course we need something else in order to characterize uh, the mechanism and the, and the specific pathway going from high end to low end. So this transition from bubbles to, to tubes. Um, so that uh, we haven't done. Uh, of course, I think there's probably other people here that, that are working on that or maybe have actually done that at this point. Um, so hopefully we'll see more of that or hear more throughout this workshop. Uh, as far as the shape of the cavity and salvation, um, 
Yeah, so there is definitely some context dependence to everything and, and things like density fluctuations are going to depend on the shape of a surface. So for example, if you were to cut like a, a nanotube in half, uh, there's a recent paper from, from Anish Patel showing that you know, if you look, I look at density fluctuations on the inside of the nanotube versus the outside, they're going to be different, right? So there is some shape dependence to everything that's going on. Uh, there is a, another question from uh, Ronald Roth, who says if you can distinguish uh, between line effects due to line tension or possibly curvature of the liquid vapor interfaces. Yes, this is also a, a good question. Um, so I will say, I guess the short answer is probably not really uh, because we're fitting everything. Uh, so we're not computing the line tension explicitly from some other manner. Uh, so we're, we're fitting the dependence at, at low end to these macroscopic uh, expressions and then getting a line tension out after we have computed things like the surface tension and the contact angle from other simulations. I will say that we, we did also try to fit uh, things with the, the Tolman length in order to account for these curvatures uh, of, the, of the, the liquid vapor interface. And um, essentially we don't get as good of fits when we try to take that into account. So uh, of course, if you add both, then you can't disentangle them. So there's the, the, the Tolman length isn't enough by itself to, to describe what's going on. Uh, so you do need the line tension, but whether or not that Tolman length that describes the curvature effects is also important, I don't know yet right now. Okay, now if, if you allow me before closing, because we are really running out of time, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to remark the following. So when we compare free energy from, sim from simulations with, for example, free energy from the sharp interface model, as you have been presenting, and I, I do the same actually, we forget always one small, small stuff is that, uh, for example, uh, in the free energy from sharp interface model, you assume that there's a formula connecting volume and free energy or radius of the bubble and free energy. Now, this formula, when you turn into, turn into the simulations, when you have a probability density, actually, uh, is not so trivial because you have, a Jacob, you have a Jacobian connecting the two free energies that we always neglect when we use the typical sharp interface model free energy. Now, when the bubble is small, you can have a big deviation from the two representations of the free energies. So, Comparison, I do the same, so it's not a criticism. I mean, but comparison there, especially when the bubble is small, is pretty critical. So we should think twice, I guess. I, I, this is a question asked for myself. How fair is the comparison in that region? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think we, we can't expect this to work in that region at all, right? I mean, that's very you know, microscopic, and we're going to need to, to think about, you know, the actual uh, details there, right? I mean, so we, we, we can't just use this, this, like you said, this, this kind of sharp interface type model where we're just thinking about a tube forming uh, and then expect it to describe things like the formation of a small bubble, right? So I, I agree. I think we need to be careful and probably we need to think more about what is needed to do comparisons at those smaller length scales. Okay, so thank you very much once again for your nice talk.